Democrats so that we can be the, the, the real leadership in which the young people need today. So, without further ado. Okay. okay. Actually, it was a very good summary of the strategic situation. Of course, it helps to hear Evelyn give a summary, but oftentimes people walk out of the room after Lynn and say, well, what did Lynn say? They say, gee, I don't know, but it was really good. <laughs> and then come back next time. <laughs> it was really good. It was really good. But they, they have a hard time grasping the essence of it. It's, it's useful to do, which is actually part of the part of the, the trick, you know. <clears throat> people always ask, they say, well, how does Lynn know so many things? How does he keep all those things in his head? But you don't keep all the things in your head by keeping track of all the details. You keep things in your head by keeping track of the thing, the simple thing, which makes all the details fit where they are. And if you can keep focused on the, the simple thing, <laughs> the simple things and the simple substances, then you actually can keep track of a lot of things. And that really is the issue that Lynn takes up in his new paper, which I hope people have had a chance to read on the, uh, the new politics. <clears throat> and I thought the beginning was quite beautiful and interesting, the way Lynn raised this question of mass effect and how an actual small group of people create a mass effect, which is not really specific to the particular thing they did to create the mass effect. But the mass effect that's, crea is, that's created is, is uh, or the particular thing, it functions, in, in what I will illustrate more tonight, as the idea of a singularity, which then creates a whole, uh, uh, a mass effect which has a, a much more general form to it. I thought the way Lynn put it, right, right, we went out and did what we had to do. And that created a general climate by which people fell free to go out and vote their conscience. And that they didn't that what that wasn't there before that, right? So it's not that people that everybody who voted, the ten million youth, the ten million people in the eighteen to thirty five year old range who voted in this last election voted because they got one of our pamphlets. Right? Because we didn't put out ten million pamphlets. Right? So they couldn't have been that. We probably didn't talk to 10 million people directly, right? And, but what was it, right? What, what made that shift after the election uh, in, to create the election? And you see in the post-election analysis that Lynn refers to, which, which everybody's done um, now, and of course you know that their, their analysis is different than the one that's in the newspaper. They get the same analysis. They they see the kind of the effect of the kinds of things we're saying, and they could see very directly that there was this shift, starting back when we in you know mid mid to late September, when Rove was saying no 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 I know something nobody else knows and we're going to win and all the Democrats started to pee in their pants because they thought oh the great master magician Carl Rove must know something we don't know right and they were preparing to lose. And then but there was that shift that happened, right? And the shift that happened was the, you know, strategic, if you think about it, we had a few strategic deployments, the Connecticut deployment, the California deployment, the deployment into Missouri, the uh, uh, stuff we did around uh, you know, <coughs> in Pennsylvania and, and so forth. You know what it is. So you get these you get the, these key strategic effects, which then have the effect of transforming the whole, uh, the whole political climate in the nation. Now, it's not that you can't do, it's not just that you could do anything and get that effect. What you have to do has to be right. It has to be, it has to uh, actually be the thing that actually is actually addressing that simple thing. Which is organizing everything else. It's not. It's not a marketing scheme. And if you just go out and say something, you're going to get everybody excited, and you'll create a new craze, and you'll get the election going. No, no, no. Point is that Lynn understood something which everybody else didn't understand, and he f deployed us to actually affect that thing, which is this generational question, which is what he's been 
been talking about for a long time. It's not that the younger generation has some inherent uh, intrinsic understanding of physical economy, <laughs> as you know. But it's that there's a they're not they don't have the brainwashing that the baby boomer generation has of to be against blue collar, to be against production, to be against um, uh, uh, physical economy. And it's it's very interesting just in terms of just you know, I'm reflecting back on this, you know, the different phases of our organizing. And you think about what we were doing, in the, in, as Lynn talks about this, right, in the 70s and early 80s, we were younger, but we were organizing World War II generation people who were not brainwashed against nuclear power and against the <coughs> physical economy. And they saw us as the force that was fighting what the rest of our generation was doing, which was being so that so you could get support from the from the older generation. Now of course they've gone off. So the generation that's in power is the baby boomer generation who is completely blocked on this stuff. But the youth generation have a completely different perspective. And Lynn understands that from this generational perspective. Which you as I mentioned Ben Franklin, but you do really need somebody who's outside your generation to give you the perspective on what your generation can do. Because you, you don't have that sense of a generational perspective unless you've lived through several generations. Most people, many people who have lived through several generations don't have that, don't really have a self, haven't really studied it the way Lynn has. You can really only understand it if, you're, if you actually go counter to your own generation, which is what Lynn did. In any case, you see this question of how this this uh, it, it, the way Lynn situated the open his new paper went from the standpoint of Kepler and the new politics, right? That this is not a question of um, sociology or political you know science or some type of of uh, study. Of, it is sociology. It's a, so, it's a study of how society functions, but society doesn't function the way sociologists say it functions. It doesn't <coughs> function by feeling states of individuals. It functions the way Kepler talks about planetary orbits. And the, as, the, as you know from working on the Kepler work on the new astronomy, the, the principle of the thing that that um, that these that that that, that, that the, the the simple substance <coughs> that it makes all the details function is not a it is change is a prince is the principle of change and of course it's very easy to say that right it's easy to repeat the aphorism that comes out of Heraclitus <laughs> fragment right nothing is constant but change it's easy to say that of course that's not really the fragment right that. That, that at least that's not what's attributed to Heraclides, right? But Heraclides is, says, you know, you can't step in the same river twice, isn't that the fragment, Brianna? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, that's what it is, that you can't step in the same river twice, right? And that then becomes this aphorism, nothing is constant but change, which of course everybody says, <laughs> but has no idea what it means, right? Because they don't really know what change is. Right, and and but uh, it it's it the reason why this grabbed Plato and the reason why this thing became such an issue and become such a a, a, a strong focus is that change. Uh, if you understand it, once you understand exactly what change is, then you have a completely different perspective. Then you can see how to create a mass effect. But if you don't understand what change is, you don't have a mass effect. I guess you could sort of think about it, you know, you're staying the course unless what changes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you just say, okay, we're no longer going to, you know, Bush, remember he did that in the middle of the election, right? He says, okay, well, no, we're, not, we're no longer staying the course. We're willing to change tactics, right? And... Uh, so we're no longer, but you're not. You are staying the course unless you actually understand what change really is. So, but what's change? Now, that's a real hard thing to get because you can say, well, change is becoming, right? 
it's when something is going from one state to becoming something else. So you could get pretty people are people are pretty good at sophistry, so they know how to answer the question, right? Oh yeah, well change is really the state of becoming, you know, where things are always in flux and always moving and always becoming something different. Well, you know, that's that's really not so that wouldn't be so significant. I mean why would why would that principle have been the guiding principle for all physical science for well, since Heraclides, so we're talking about say twenty five hundred years, but but it obviously was recognized by people long before him. So it's not it's 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 how do you actually get the point of what Heraclides meant by change, or what Plato meant by change, or what um, uh, Cusa meant by this question of change. And that's why Lynn has really put the heat on us to master Kepler, because you, you can't get this from just uh, uh, trying to describe it. You actually have to get the real physical sense. It's like a qu the question of creativity. You know, Lynn is probably the best person in the world at describing creativity. Very few writers in history have actually been able to describe the creative process. Something Kant says can't be done. But, you know, I mean, Lynn's not the only one to, to describe the creative. Schiller describes the creative process quite profoundly. Plato does to a large degree. And all great artists describe the creative process. But Lynn gets inside the creative process in a certain sense a little bit deeper. But um, you still don't know what, the, what creativity is by reading a description of it, even a good one. Right? It might inspire you to be interested in this thing called creativity. <laughs> but you know creativity when you've actually had the experience, which of course is what education really is. Education is experiencing creativity, the creative, a creative discovery. And that's why Plato, of course, uses the, the Mino, in the Mino dialogue, uses this question of the doubling the square and the doubling the cube as the examples of how to get somebody to experience what a creative discovery actually is. Um, and so this is where the thing comes on about uh, Kepler and this question of change. Because when you, when you work it through, and also with the music, because when you work it through in these two domains, both experiencing it from the standpoint of music and also experiencing it from the standpoint of the physical principle, you uh, actually understand what change really is as opposed to some definition of what you mean by change. And um, uh, in, in this is, you know, as Lynn has emphasized, if you don't do it, if you don't get inside of it, you don't get it. You can't, there's no way to get it. There's no shortcut for it. But once you get it, then that becomes the basis by which you can actually recognize it in, in many, many, many different manifestations, like in this question of politics, which is Lynn is talking about with uh, mass effect and Kepler's orbits. That, I mean, who else would look at a political campaign the way Kepler looks at a planetary orbit? So the first reaction someone's going to get, that you know, idiot mathematician's going to get, if they write me the equations, right? right? And this is what people were trying to do with Lynn's economics. They were trying to write a system of equations that would that would uh, reflect what Lynn is saying about economics. It's not a question of, of the equation. It's a question of understanding how this principle of change actually works. Another way to get at this, which I'll just reference here and then go back to this question of Kepler, is the difficulty we always have in uh, discussing the question of anti-entropy, that physical, the universe is fundamentally anti-entropic. We had a big argument about this in Mexico. Not an argument, but a, a difficulty about it, because the problem was, how do you, with the word itself, right, and no matter whether you use anti-entropy or negative entropy or negentropy, it, people are very much confused by it, because it assumes that there's, there's, there's something called entropy, which exists. And then the universe is sort of like the little engine that could. <laughs> 
<laughs> struggling against this this uphill battle against entropy, right? And it's an ultimately losing battle because you never get up to the top of the hill, right? <laughs> but you say, I know I can. I know I can be anti-entropic. <laughs> but, but the reality is that there is no such thing as entropy. It really doesn't exist. I had a, a, a funny conversation. I was doing some fundraising on Saturday night, and Susan asked me to call one of her contacts who's a phys physicist. I think he's a teacher, a tweener, in his early 30s. So we were having this discussion about, he, he was very provoked about what we say about Newton, right? So we were going on. Of course, he hasn't read Kepler. He's a PhD physicist, but of course, he doesn't know Kepler. He hasn't read anything by Kepler. He doesn't know anything about the new astronomy. But we got into this question <coughs> of entropy, mm -hmm. and he was trying to argue that, well, yeah, the, the uh, you know, I was raised the question of physical economy. <coughs> he was saying, yeah, but, you know, there really is a, all that development of mankind and the higher organization of the states of, of the planet Earth all are associated with an increase in entropy because for every activity, there's a dissipation of heat, and that dissipates out. I said, well, what about thought? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, yeah, but there's a, there's a, you know, there's an electrochemical interaction which has some heat <laughs> loss <laughs> associated <laughs> with it. <laughs> right? Which I don't know if it's even true, right? I mean, that's, that's an assumption, right? That you're, that you're assuming that, that the actual chemical interactions of a living process are the same as a non-living process. There's an assumption that it's entropic, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of assumptions embedded in basic experiments. But anyway, I said, yeah, but the point is the effect of the thought, what's the effect of the thought itself? Not that the thought produces a dissipation of heat, but the, but the effect of an idea on transforming the entire planet is cannot be measured by the amount of heat that's dissipated <laughs> as a result of that thought. <coughs> right? You know, you when you gonna, you know you write some equation where you add up all the all the the heat exchanges that that are the result of the introduction of Kepler's discovery of universal gravitation. <laughs> and I, 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 I said, well, look at, look at an even different one. Okay, say, what's the, what is the heat, what is the uh, effect of the ex heat exchange of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? But it, it clearly transformed physically the entire planet. And it's still transforming the planet to this day because it gave a concentrated voice to a consent to an idea which otherwise had not been stated in that in that way in that form before which which uh, encapsulated the whole history of in the sense the, the history of the nature of mankind so in fact the universe is not entropic in which there's an anti-entropic tendency associated with life and cognition but that the universe is characteristically anti-entropic, and if we could come up with a better word for it, we should. <laughs> Did he get it? Uh, he he said, well, this is really interesting, you know. <laughs> I think his main problem is that he likes to smoke pot, which is the other thing. <laughs> 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 He's a tweener. <laughs> I, said, I said, that's the problem, you know. How much heat dissipates when you smoke pot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I'm sure. Anyway, but you, what you have is is fundamentally an a an anti-entropic universe in which entropy doesn't exist. It's not that entropy is the exception. It's not that okay if you take a a closed system, you can create an entropic process, but entropy doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. That's what changes. That's what Heraclides means by nothing is constant but change. What he means is, what we would say in modern terms, is that the universe is everywhere anti-entropic. That there's no place in the universe for entropy. There's no place in the universe for, for uh, an 
equilibrium state. It's not like, you know, that's the, that's the other theory you get on the, the, the entropy, the pendulum theory of politics and history, right? The pendulum swings left, the pendulum swings right, and we have to, we have to go towards the center. You know, everything has to go to the center. That's what everybody's saying about politics. We, the Democrats are too far left and the Republicans are too far <laughs> right, but you really got to get the center here, where it's the big center, right? And of course, the center they're talking about is not the center. It's a small portion of the of the extreme baby boomer upper twenty percent. You know, the people most disassociated from the physical economy. That's what they call the center. Turn into the only Yeah, right. <laughs> which is such a small percentage of the population. Which is actually, you know, like there was this UN report that came out today, right, that said that one percent of the world's population has something like 50% uh, of the wealth and another 5% has another 20%. I can't remember. It's it one of these tip things that sort of just documents what Lynn is saying. 90% of the population controls, you know, has access to about only about 15% uh, of the world. When you take the global population, but if you're say, talking about globalism and the global economy, you're talking about the state of the economy, you got to look at the state of the whole world. You can't say, oh, well, globalism is good because if you if you only count the people who benefit from globalism, it's good. <laughs> and just just draw a line around <laughs> everybody. <laughs> 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 you just redistrict it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you get this question. So this is this idea of of there is no equilibrium state. I think this is one of the. Uh, it's, it's, it's accepted so much as an axiom that it's really something that you got to attack. And you can, can attack it a lot by, by Kepler because the point is there is, no, there is no equilibrium in politics. That's sort of the Hegelian Francis Fukuyama idea of the end of history. We've now come to the no more ideological struggles and we're all agreed that freedom and democracy and free trade is the best and it's just a matter of time before it dominates the whole world. But that's not what happens. What happens is the u there is no the, the universe is is inherently anti-entropic, and even those things that appear to be entropic, like for example, the collapse of living standards when you do not um, develop the uh, physical, economic, <coughs> and cultural infrastructure, is itself an indication of the inherent anti-entropic characteristic of the universe. Because by, by uh, um, uh, reacting in that way, the universe is demanding anti-entropy. In other words, the tendency of the universe is to be anti-entropic. And if, you, if, you, if, if, if the universe will react against, you get a, a reaction against anything that tries to introduce entropy. The universe clears it away. So. So you, how do you, you, you get this sense, I think, and I think this is really one of the most difficult things for people to get with Kepler, is that this is really the principle that Kepler is focused on, this question of change. And this is what Brian and I were talking about earlier around the, the third book, right, where, where it appears that people always get puzzled because it appears that Kepler, after disputing the equine, is now introducing the equine. <laughs> Uh -huh. But he's using the term equine, but what he's talking about, as he later demonstrates, is not an equine. It's not a point of equal motion. And what Kepler does in the in his both his his refutation of the use of the, the mean sun or the apparent sun, which is which is important, but it's also not the key point. Because it's important because you're saying, okay, we're going to use the apparent sun instead of the mean sun. But you're still talking about a measurement. You're still talking about whether or not we're going to eat lunch when the sun is at its zenith or when our watch is, say, noon. I mean, you could actually <laughs> organize your day according to the true sun <laughs> and actually organize society that way. I mean, you know, farmers do it. In fact, the mean sun, people, you know, what do you need a watch for? If you're, if you're out, actually out there, if you're, you know, an agricultural society, the true sun is a much better way to organize your day. Uh, than, than your watch is why you know people in 
agricultural districts don't like daylight savings time because it's. <laughs> 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 that's why they had daylight savings. Yeah. No, they got the farmers always hated it because it makes it get it makes it get dark. It makes it get light later, right? Well, we have it because people moved off the farm and they like to have, they, they get up later. <laughs> so they like the light at night. And the farmer wants the light in the morning because the cows want to get milked, not when your watch says, but when it's time to get milked, right? If you've ever been around a dairy farm, you know when the cows know when they need to get milked. And, and if you're a farmer, the dairy farmers are much to be, be uh, praised for their dedication to their to their work because you know you 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 can't sleep you can't sleep in the cows don't <laughs> <laughs> there's a certain physical reality right yeah. there um, and they don't take Sundays off you know <laughs> <laughs> they get pretty angry if they're if they're not relieved from their anyway <laughs> the um, uh, the, the point is is that, the, so the issue on the mean sun versus the apparent sun is important in that Kepler says, okay, what, let's actually look at what the planets, let's figure out what the planets are doing from the standpoint of what they're actually doing, as opposed to from some mean motion. But the, the, the key turning point is in the second part, in the vicarious hypothesis, where he uses the different views of the, <coughs> both the eccentric view of the latitude and the other point to prove that no matter how hard you try, no matter what system you look at, Ptolemy, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, it's not the, the problem is not where you put the sun or the earth. The problem is if you try and fit uniform motion into what is inherently a non-uniform world. That is, the world is everywhere non-uniform. If it's everywhere non-uniform, there's no place of uniformity. There's no place to rest. It's always changing. That's what Heraclitus means by there is no, nothing is constant but change. It is everywhere everything is changing. Now, change is not just arbitrary. It's not just things becoming something different as Kepler's planetary motions. But once you have a something which is always changing, then it's always changing in a certain way. There's a certain characteristic to that change. There's, a, there's what you might even call a directionality to the change. And that directionality is what we mean by anti-entropy. Now you take, take this in the case of the planetary orbit. You take it in the case of the planetary orbit, if you've got a planet's motion which is, which is always changing, then, and it's orbicular, then there will be in that planetary orbit a, a directionality. Direction from speeding up to slowing down and then a reverse direction from slowing down to speeding up. And when you have such a characteristic, you have a, uh, you have two, in this case, two singularities, which are the places where the planet stops speeding up and starts slowing down and starts slowing down start speeding up, where there's a change in the way it's changing. Okay? So now the position of the planet is relatively, is completely secondary. The position of the planet is a function of the characteristic of its change. And this is what you see with Kepler. Mass does not matter. The orbit, the planetary orbits are not determined by the mass of the planet. The planetary orbits and the position and shape of the planetary orbits are not determined by the, uh, well, once you have these, let's just say, add one more thing, once you have these singularities, then you have a relationship among the planets based on the relationship among these singularities. Which is what these guys are putting together from Kepler's Harmonies of the World, which is basically, I mean, that's really the point that Kepler's showing you, that the whole universe is tuned. You say, how could the whole universe be tuned? So that every motion this is so complicated and so many details, etc., etc. How could every single one of these motions be according to some principle? Right? Then you would have to know that Mars has to do this at this point and that point so that it correlates with Jupiter at this point and this point. 
and, and Venus and all these, you know, all these point-wise adding this whole thing up, right? And that's, but that's not, that's, Kepler does it much more simply, right? Because he says, no, it can be tuned because it's tuned by tuning the principles of change. You tune how things change. And the, 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 the harmonic relationship is a relationship among things that are changing. Among the principles of change, not among all the little detailed parts, right? And that then determines the whole thing. That's the simple, the simple idea. So that's why Kepler is so important in what, to study, and why Lynn said that all modern science really is based on Kepler, because what what Kepler, I mean, Kepler didn't initiate this, right? It's initiated really by Cusa, and that's something that has to be really grasped. That Cusa introduces this, this method into science. What Kepler does is he applies Kuz's method in such a uh, rigorous <coughs> way that you can't deny that that really is the way the universe works. I mean, he shows that that's really the way the universe actually works. And he says, you know, look at these motions of the planets and you're, you're stuck with this, you, you, this conclusion. Now, that then causes um, um, uh, Kepler, of course, it causes him a problem because, as you know, if things are always changing, then the problem is you have to be able to think about change. We, we need a new, well, what Kepler basically says, I need a new way to think about change. I need to have a new type of mathematics. And this is what Leibniz uh, invented with the calculus. The calculus is simply, <coughs> excuse me, a mathematics which expresses position as a function of change, which takes the change as primary, and everything else is a function of the idea of change. And what Riemann does is he. Uh, takes the extension of Leibniz's work and uh, shows even a more general way to look at it, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight. Now, but the, the first point is that what Riemann, what Leibniz does with the idea of the calculus is he introduces in this new um, <coughs> concept, yeah, you should put that up because I'm going to show a few pictures for you. Um, is a idea of in the calculus, which is which is actually a simpler way to understand the calculus, but it's the exact ass backward way of the way they teach it in school is the ass backward of the of the way it really should be understood. Because what you usually get in school is you get the um, calculus begins with something that that Leibniz never had never talked about at all, which they call the derivative. And they always introduce this by this stupid, this is the other problem with, with uh, course science, when you don't do it from the standpoint of Kepler, you get this kind of bullshit, uh, you know, uh, problems like suppose you wanted to find the tangent to a curve at any point. And you say, well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher says, oh, well, you'll find out later, right? And they never tell you. And they never tell you. <laughs> and uh, then they say, suppose you want to find out that find the area under a curve. And you say, why would I want to do that? <laughs> and they say, oh well, don't worry about it. You'll find out. <laughs> and then, and then, then, you know, then once you've decided you're going to go through this, they 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 introduce you to a class which is the one that that is sort of the ultimate initiation into nerd. <laughs> <laughs> which is called differential equations. And the diff way the class... The w Is anybody going to see that? No, just, just have <laughs> Okay. The way... There you go. The way uh, they describe differential equations is say differential equations are equations in which the variables are... Uh, the uh, differentials of the function, and you have to figure out what the function was. 
And you say, well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> and then they tell you the real thing is they say, well, in general, you can never solve these things. That you can only solve them in specific cases, in special cases, but in most cases you can't solve them. So in, pr in principle, we're going to study a whole field which you have nothing to do. And then they write a differential equation on the board, and they say, okay, now the way you solve this differential equation is you guess, the fo you, you, you take the following guess, and you ask the guy, well, why did you guess that way? And Will knows this. He's taken one of these classes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> they write the equation on the board, you know. Where's my pen? You need a marker? There's a bunch right there. Let's put this up for Will's edification here. <laughs> They say the second derivative plus the function is equal to zero. And you say, okay, solve that equation. And you say, why would I want to solve that equation? <laughs> you say, well, we're just trying to, this is a trick, you know, it's a little puzzle here. And they say, well, the way it's solved is the solution to this equation, and they tell you the solution to the equation. And you say, they say, well, how did you figure that out? They say, yes, okay. How did you figure that out? And they say, well, we figured that out because that's, uh, that's the way we solved that equation. And you say, you say, well, how did the first guy who solved this equation figure that out? <laughs> they say, oh, well, that's what your history, your, if you get a PhD in mathematics, you're interested in that. But right now, for you guys, you're really <laughs> interested in that. Um, but, the point is that actually the calculus begins with this idea that Leibniz had of what he what what he called a differential equation or a differential function. Now you're already familiar with this by working at Kepler, looking at Kepler. The idea of the equal area principle is in effect really the first exa examination of an explicit idea of a differential function. Or even state it more more fundamentally, what you have you have uh, a uh, the idea that the speed of the planet is inversely proportional to the distance to the sun. And now that relationship that the speed is inversely proportional to the distance to the sun is what determines the. Uh, characteristic of the planetary orbit, right? It's not the motion along the arc, but the motion along the arc is a, is a function of this relationship of the distance, in, uh, uh, the speed increasing and decreasing with distance from the sun. Now, you don't see the planet increase and decrease. You don't see the distance from the sun increasing and decreasing you see the planet speeding up and slowing down, right? And, but what Kepler does, he says, well, the, the, but, and so you say, well, what, what do you see? You don't see, in fact, you don't even see the planet speeding up and slowing down, but you see when you take two different motions, either the, the planet's, mo in particular, the planet's motion as it appears from the Earth and the sun's motion as it appears from the Earth. <laughs> and you take these two motions, or these basically three positions of Earth, Sun, Mars, and the fixed star, the four positions, out of that you uh, can uh, understand a principle of change. And that principle of change has a certain characteristic, and you say what's causing that change to occur the way it's occurring? And that's where Kepler develops his hypothesis of the principle of gravitation, that the cause of that principle of change would be the effect of a relationship of change in which speed, which is position with respect to time, is changing with respect to distance. And that's a functional relationship. As the distance gets greater, the speed gets 
uh, slower, etc., et and, and inversely. Okay, so it's a functional relationship. But what's the functional relationship? It's not x, you know, is the ordinate and y is the abscissa or the other way around, right? It's not a it's not a graph. It's a it's a functional relationship of a physical physically functional relationship. Okay, that's what you mean by a differential function. Another example of this such a differential function is is um, uh, is um, the catenary principle, right? And that's why the catenary is a very important thing to study uh, because uh, you can really can't bullshit the catenary, as Galileo tried to do, right? He tried to bullshit the catenary and, and it didn't work because the catenary, the chain has a particular shape. It doesn't, it's not arbitrary. And you can do anything you want with the hanging points. You can, you can increase the weight of the chain. You can, and you've done that experiment, which is fun to do, right? You take a real thin, light chain and a big, heavy chain, and you hold them up at the same point, and they'll make the same shape, even though the weight's the same. So what's the, what's the, uh, the so you could do all, all, create all these different, but, but the principle of change produces a shape, right? So this particular shape, how do you know what that shape is? It doesn't fit with any of the existing mathematics. So how does Bernoulli figure it out? Bernoulli figures it out by um, figuring out what's the characteristic of the principle of change. How does the curvature of the chain reflect a changing physical relationship? That changing physical relationship is what's called the differential function. And the shape of the chain, then, is the solution to that differential function. The solution is not a particular catenary. The solution is the family of all possible catenaries. And one catenary differs from another catenary simply by a simple relationship. It's not a, a, a transcendental relationship. It's a very simple relationship. Okay. So... So that that's those are two examples of how this concept of this idea of a differential equation got introduced into physics and um, out of Leibniz and then out of also uh, Kepler and then Leibniz and Bernoulli. Now this becomes then the, really the basis of all physical of all physics. This is what Riemann means when he says in his in his um, uh, lectures uh, on uh, physics, he says that physics, the study of the physical universe, re really began with the study of the infinitesimally small. He means what you're looking at, the, f the study of physics, only became possible when we were a when we began to investigate the way physical principles, universal physical principles, act in a determined but changing way in every infinitesimally, in the infinitesimally small. That's what um, Kepler, I mean, that's what Riemann means by that. <coughs> so, uh, and this is, of course, what Gauss did in trying to determine the orbit of Ceres. Gauss recognized, here I've got this small interval of the planet's orbit, and everything about the, 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 all the, the entire solar system's imp, uh, uh, relationships are expressed in that little, that little interval. And the way I'm going to determine what that orbit is, is by, f is by looking at how these universal principles are expressed in every infinitesimally small interval. Um, so, uh, it's shocking to see these two guys in suits. I ask myself, what's happened here? Did the FBI show up? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, <laughs> I don't think you're so sure you're too much off topic. Okay, but, but go ahead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. In the internal, with the Lynn, which Lynn has touched upon a little bit, 
but Lynn introduced the idea that the musical comma is akin to the infinitesimal yeah. in science. Can mm -hmm. you go through that? Yeah. Room? It's the same thing that, that, that I was talking about with the with the Kepler. And this is something that that Archytas already recognized. This question of nothing is and uh, um, all the way back in in the Greek times, which is that um, uh, when you take, I mean, you guys saw the demonstration first of all, right? When you try and derive the musical intervals by dividing a string, you you can't do it, right? You get you the phys, you, there's a paradox. The paradox is not in the mathematics per se. But it is in the mathematics per se. Because it's just like trying to calculate the planetary orbits, like what Kepler does with the vicarious hypothesis. When you try and uh, calculate the non uniform motion of the planet from the standpoint of uniform motion, you get eight minutes of an arc difference. No matter how you try and uh, no matter which system you're using, no matter whether you're using the latitudes, you get a little bit more whether you're having a bisected eccentricity or uh, eccentricity which is not bisected, no matter how you monkey with all the things you can monkey with, mm -hmm. right? you're going to be eight minutes of an arc off. That's what that little experiment Jason came up with is a good one, where you have the observed positions and the and the measured positions, and you try and find the place where these will be on a circle and the other two things will be on the line of apsides. That's really hard to do. And so the point is, is that, but what you do, what Kepler does by exhaust, that's why part two is really, really a crucial part to get in Kepler, the so-called vicarious hypothesis. That's where Kepler himself says, you know, this eight minutes of an arc changed the world. Because once you get that, then you, that, that's the eerie part. Because you realize that what he's just shown is that the universe, you know, spits out equal motion, <laughs> and that—that's what people really freaked out about, right? So the same thing is true with 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 musical tones. If you try and derive the musical tones by any type of fixed way, and it's already in the mathematics. This is what Archytas is the famous thing where you can't find a, a rational geometric mean between two numbers, one of which is one more than the other, n plus one over n, the so-called super particular ratio. Because right? this is the form of all the intervals that you get, right, in the uh, in the musical, in the uh, in the dividing the string, right? You get the it's all in this form, right? That's that's what the that's what the string tell, to tells you to tells you thinks harmonics is, right? But the problem is, you see, you can't really divide the string that way, because you'll always come up with some some incommensurability. All right, so where is that incommensurability? It's a small amount, right? But it's a physically existent incommensurability. Which means that if this is your concept of musical pitches, you're you're in a fantasy world, right? You can't compose music. You can't sing. You can't com communicate an idea. You can only pluck a string. You could be a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> and since they don't care whether they sing on tune or not, they, they, the, the comma doesn't mean much to them, right? Okay, so the point is, is though, where is, what is the discrepancy? Is there some way that we can resolve this discrepancy by some trick, right? Like, can we take the like with Galileo with the parabola and the and the catenary? Because if you take a really big parabola and a really small catenary, it gets really really close. Can you resolve this difference somehow by singing off key? bellowing, you know, or being a rock musician, or Bob Dylan, you know. Uh. <laughs> but you can't. You can't resolve this, right? So you have to have a whole different conception of, of music. But it's in this small discrepancy that the actual musical domain is discovered. And the actual musical domain is not discovered in some mathematical treatise 
but it's in the performance of the of a musical piece itself, and not just any performance, but a performance which actually reaches out, grabs the audience, and changes them. And the hardest performance to do, the absolute hardest performance like that to do, is with a chorus. I mean, it's much easier for a a, a, a um, um, you know a, a, a a uh, small group of, uh, or say a soloist to do it, right? But, or a string quartet is also hard, but not not as hard as a chorus, actually. There are very few good string quartets, but they're all, they're really, um, you know, a, cor a good a good chorus, which actually can, which, which actually does it, is very, 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 very rare. That's why, you know, the work we're doing on the choral work is so important, because to actually get a group of people who all have to apply their creative processes in a unified way to produce a, 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 a result is extremely difficult thing to do. But that's where you get the sense of what the Pythagorean comedy is. And you're beginning to get that because, and that's where the question of the <coughs> vocal training comes in. Because if you do the vocal training, then your voice starts to be able to obey your mind. And now you're, we're at the point, beginning to get to the point, where people can start to pay attention to these very, very small details, like the thing that John discovered in working with the women in the last rehearsal, right? And you ended up seeing the Pythagorean comma come up. That's not the only place the comma comes up in, in the Yezu Minor Fort. It comes up, you know, everywhere, right? But you, you, but when you work on those things, the audience may not say, oh, yeah, that's I see the way you did that, you did that. But the audience might not be aware of all the details, but they're totally aware of all the details. Because it's the difference between them being moved by the performance to them act or them just saying, well, that was pleasant. <laughs> to the point where they actually walk out shaken. Right? Like the difference between a great dramatic performance versus, you know, just a just a rendering of the play is the one where the audience walks out shaken because they learn something about themselves in the play. But a chorus does that too. Right? And so that's the, that's that is the point of the Pythagorean comma. It means that there is no it's not something that you can define by by markings on a page. It's not something that you can define by by physical by a by a, a instructions. It's a it's an intuitive it's not an intuitive thing, but it's it's something that is in the uh, in the mind, in the same way Kepler recognizes the principle of gravitation. It's not in the formula, but it's in this functional relationship. Okay, so what you, what what um, what uh, so what what happens after Kepler, what happens with Kepler and what happens with Leibniz is take, taking up Kepler's challenge, is real science begins. And real science begins by looking at this question of how things change. Functional relationship of change. And you have to rethink about everything. Everything is different then. And um, we talked about this last time. I don't know if anybody solved the problem yet. On the uh, Pythagorean. Are you going to work on it? No, I'm not going to give you the answer. I don't want to have a little more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the Mino dialogue. You, 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 once you, you know, once, uh, <laughs> once you're, you're, you got all the information. It's just solving the problem. Socrates did a lot more with the slave boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that for you. <laughs> but the point is, is that what it indicates is that there's something about the why are some why are some Pythagorean triangles rational and some not? What make what is there a functional relationship between when they become rational and when they become not? In principle, they're they're not rational. But there's some is there some functional relation? There's obviously some type of functional relationship in which the rational ones, you know. It's rational that they're rational, right? And and it's and and but that that's the special case of the general principle. 
Uh, and you also have to relook at things like the um, like the circle, which is where we get to this fellow here, right? You take the circle, you say, well, the circle is the perfect example of something which doesn't change. And even on this case, Aristotle was wrong. Because the circle is actually everywhere changing. Now, this is something Aristotle didn't like, right? Aristotle said, no, the circle is perfect because it doesn't change. Actually, he's wrong. The circle is always changing. It's an example of something that's everywhere changing. How is it everywhere changing? Well, this is what Gauss is actually already evident, as Kepler points out, in the um, first book of the Harmonies, going back to the construction of the regular polygons. Because the regular polygons, if you want to divide the circle into parts, you can't necessarily do it in a simple way. You, you, it, you find that the circle is everywhere changing. Because you could divide the circle in half and four is one way. But to divide into three parts is a different thing. To divide into four parts is a further different thing. To divide into five parts, you've got to do something else. And then you run up against this boundary called at, at seven. But then all of a sudden, you can cross that boundary at 15. You're back to something that can be done. And so why is it that some of these can be divided, some of these can be created, and why is it that some of them can't? What's the, what's the, um, what's the, uh, what's the principle of change which is causing that to happen? Well, the, first, the only person who resolves this is Gauss, right? In his idea of the division of the circle, in which he shows that, in principle, when you look at the circle, not as you look at the circle in the way you look at a planetary orbit, as the effect of some principle of change. Now, what's this principle of change? The principle of change is the non-uniform connected relationship of the circular functions. Right? So instead of thinking of the circle as producing the circular functions, you have to think of the circular functions as generating the circle. Well, you say, why would I do that? Because the circle is nice and uniform and simple. The circular functions are transcendental and non-uniform and complicated. Why should I try and take, think of something simple as being the effect of something complicated <laughs> and something, instead of something complicated being the effect of something simple? But the fact of the matter is, is that, is that if you think of the circle as being primary, that's all you can do. You can't divide it. But when that, that and, and you find that when you go out and you look at the physical universe, the physical universe doesn't care about the circle. It cares about something different. Like, for example, the catenary. The catenary principle, right, is the principle of change that governs the catenary is not a uniform one, but it's based on the side of the angle, right? It's based on the, you know, the the um, the uh, force at any point, right? Is based on the sine of the angle, not not based on the uh, um, the angle, not based on the arc, or you know the uh, question of refraction and reflection, right? It's based on the, the sign of the angle, not based on the angle itself. So that's, so the physical universe doesn't like the circle. It likes the circular function. The thing that you think is complicated, the physical universe thinks is simple. Okay? All right, but this is not one, these are not separate functions. That's the other thing that gets people screwed up and math classes. They talk about the cosine and the sine and the tangent. These are all just one. Actually, we can add the tangent in here. So there you go. That's all your trigonometric functions. This is your tangent. This is your sine. This is your cosine. This is your cotangent. No, isn't the tangent? You can do it either way. Yeah. 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 Oh, you want this one? Yeah, you could do that too. Oh, it's the same. 
tangent. You could, you could do that too. This can be your tangent. And you get your cotangent and everything else is all in there. But the point is, what is it? It's a functional relationship that expresses what Kuza talks about really is the difference between the curved and the straight. <coughs> so now, you can think about the fact that the cosine, I think I talked about this last time, but I'll do it again, that the cosine gets uh, smaller while the sine gets bigger, Okay, and the rate at which the cosine gets smaller is the same rate at which the sine gets bigger. Okay, so the rate of change of the cosine is the sine, and the rate of change of the sine is the cosine. And then the rate of the rate of change of the cosine is the sine, or it's minus. The rate of the rate of yeah. change is the cosine. The rate of the rate of change of the cosine is the, is the cosine. Okay, so that's why that would be that's why the sine and the cosine are the solutions to this differential equation because you have a functional relationship of two things that are changing inversely to each other in opposite directions what is that differential equation that there is? I missed that one. Mm -hmm. oh yeah is that this is the, the one that derivative plus yeah, plus the function is equal to zero. Oh. That's the one that the, they always put up on the, on the, Will had this torture, right? Yeah. They put that up and they say, okay, how do you solve this? And you say, well, you, first you have to guess at it. <laughs> they have like a list of, of functions like that. Yeah. And they'll have like what you should guess with. Yeah, right. Multiple <laughs> choice. <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's what happens. Here's the history of it. So you be, this is just an example, right? So you look at this history. You get this fact that people now see that you're going to introduce this, this idea of a, that, 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 as Riemann says, physical science begins with the idea of, of the infinitesimal, these differential equations. In other words, what <laughs> science really has to investigate is change, because that's what you measure. That's what your physics is giving you. Your physics is giving you how things are changing. And you've got to say, OK, well, what is the principle that would cause these changes to be this way? So the solution to the differential equation is the principle which reflects that change. Uh, here's the change. What's the principle that reflects that change? Now, when you investigate all these other physical problems in this way, like, for example, the pendulum, Right? That's another example of Galileo being shown to be an idiot. This, you know, Galileo looked at the chandelier swinging in the church, and he measured his pulse, and he said, it, well, it swings with equal, equal uh, periods. And, and it probably did, or at least relative to his pulse, <laughs> <laughs> because the pendulum swings a very slow arc, very small arc. And so the arc, I mean a chandelier, and so the arc in a very small pendulum, the period, the time, is proportional to the angle. But when you take a bigger arc, then the time is not proportional to the angle. It's proportional to something more complicated. Because the, 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 uh, um, the uh, pendulum is not swinging uniformly. It's accelerating, right, as it goes down. It starts at zero, and it gets faster and faster and faster and faster, reaches the maximum speed, then it starts to get slower and slower and slower. It's like a planetary orbit, right? It has a, in, It's increasing. It's, it's never uniform. It's increasing its velocity, reaches a maximum, reaches a minimum, reaches a maximum, reaches a minimum. So it's like a planetary orbit. And when you, uh, when you uh, 
investigate the, the principle of change, the differential equation for that. It comes out to be exactly the same equation you end up with with an elliptical orbit. And then there are other more complicated types of physical problems. And you get a whole, these things that, that Will was tortured with in school, where you get a, a book of all these differential equations. And they give these equations names named for the people <laughs> who discovered them. And some of them are quite important people like Bessel, there's the Bessel functions, and there's the Legendre functions, and there's the Lagrange equations, and the Laplace equations. They have a whole book. You can buy books on the internet for a buck a piece that uh, engineering students have thrown back at used bookstores. That we'll give you all the list of these things. In any case, so this is so, so but and it's funny because you get these physical problems, all these different types of physical problems, and they all seem to have a whole bunch of different differential equations associated with them. So Gauss comes along and realizes that actually all these different physical problems, which have seemingly all these different functions associated with it, are all special cases of a particular type of function that he called the hypergeometric function. So the hypergeometric function <coughs> is, a spe is the general case of almost all the functions which uh, were discovered, the physical functions which are discovered in, in um, physical, in, the, um, uh, in these investigations of physical problems, in astronomy and physics and so forth. And this is why Riemann in his paper on the hypergeometric fu function, he says, he says, you know, the reason why you got to understand these is because these functions comprise almost everything we know about physics. And they're all special cases of this, of this simple function. Now, the mathematical form of the function, you know, you have this algebraic form of the function, which I, I wrote down for you one time. But that's not what's important about it. What Riemann said is, how are we going to understand this thing? He said, well, you can't really, you can only, you, you can try and understand it by manipulating these equations, which is the other part of the, the torturous part of solving these things, is all the manipulations with these equations and so on and so forth, right? But Riemann says we don't have to do any of that, right? Because there's a very simple geometrical way to do this. In the same way that Gauss showed, if you construct a certain type of geometry, you can solve all the algebraic equations. You can show the, the fundamental characteristic of all the algebraic equations with a simple geometry. So Gauss, Riemann says, well, you can do this very simply with the understanding the hypergeometric equation, uh, which is what I'll show you right now. Now, the, the other important point about this, the other thing about this, is that what Riemann introduces here is that the um, that when you have these differential types of equations, there's something that crops up which otherwise uh, you wouldn't notice, which is what, where the real singularities are. The real singularities are the places where the principle of change becomes ill-defined. Okay? Like, for example, if you take the elliptical orbit. In the elliptical orbit, the planet is, Keplerian orbit, the planet is always speeding up and slowing down. And so, therefore, it's always speeding up by a certain amount, right? And it's speeding up by a certain amount, which is proportional to how much the distance is increasing or decreasing. So it's, and it's in a certain direction. So it's, it's, it's very, it's, uniquely defined. But at the point at which the planet is not speeding up or slowing down, when it's making that change, retrospectively it's, it's well defined. But at that, at that moment of change, the principle of change is ill-defined. Right? It's not, it's not clear. It's not it, how much is it going to? How much is it going to speed up or slow down? In other words, 
So take an example. Take the, the the simple case of a stick in a in the ground, and you've got the sun, and you're measuring how the sun comes up. As it gets closer to noon, the shadow gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, and then the shadow starts to get longer and longer and longer. Right. So it's getting shorter by a, at a certain rate, and then it's going to get longer at a certain rate. But at the point at which it's changing from getting shorter to getting longer, what's the rate of change? The rate of change is, is, is uniquely defined in everywhere in that process, except at the point that is changing. That's where the rate of change is ill-defined. That's what's called a singularity. Okay? Because not that the not that the shadow disappears at that point, but you can't define uniquely what the rate of change is except retrospectively, except with respect to the whole process. So what Riemann um, shows is that it's these singularities, it's the relationship between such sing physical singularities physically determined places where where things are ambiguous. And the relationship of those am physically determined singularities or discontinuities to the general characteristics that if you if you investigate that, then you can actually define <coughs> what a whole series of th uh, you can define what um, uh, we would now call physical hypergeometries. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. At that place, the rate of change is ill-defined. Right. It's not that you can define those, but the relationship of those things to the whole. Now, this becomes. It sets somewhat abstract to say it that way, but it's useful to say it that way to sort of just make a general point. But Riemann, of course, doesn't says, well, we can do this much more simply by doing by not thinking it of, it of it that way, but doing it geometrically. And that's why he invented this idea of these Riemann surfaces. So now, Dan, if you turn this on, I'll finally show you some pictures. Thank you. You, you little took a little bit. up and ready to roll. And I got to do my wind up, you know, before I throw the pitch. <laughs> God had to wind you up so your orbits could still work. Is, do you have it on the output? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let it okay. <coughs> okay. So we're, what, what we're what what I'm going to show you is how this works from the standpoint how Riemann's geometrical treatment of this idea of hypergeometry is. Uh, he treated it from the standpoint of these re of his Riemann surfaces, these Riemann surface functions. Okay. Nope. No, no, no. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me see. Wait a minute. I'll go to here. Do we do it that way with you? I do it the way Adam the tells settings. me to do it. Settings. <laughs> Yep. Settings. Go to, uh, yeah. See? Extend my windows. Oh, I didn't do that. Uh huh. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry. I thought I just I just do what Adam tells me. Minus plus. Oh, you don't expect me to get them all. How about this one? Okay. Nope. Yep. Oh, oh, I know. I have to do, let's see, what did I do here wrong? Yep, that it is. No, 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 this one. Uh, display slide show on yep. monitor. Show presentation. There we go. Okay. All right, there you go. That's real simple. It's about the simplest thing that you get. Now, um, this is what Riemann says, okay, well, let's take Gauss's idea of the complex plane, the complex domain. 
right, in which you have the, uh, and I just colored, I just drew in some of the points, right, where you think of every point on this surface as being represented by a complex number. So that what a complex function is, is simply a mapping. And you're mapping one surface onto the other. Okay? Now the thing about complex functions, and obviously I'm skipping a bunch of steps here, is that these surfaces are not geometrical surfaces. These are the, these are the, these surfaces have the physical characteristics of um, what Gauss calls potential surfaces or, or, or any type of uh, physical physical surface. And um, so this is, this is and, and what Riemann does is he divides the, 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 the plane into two halves. Okay, and I colored them two different colors. <laughs> so you can see there's two halves. This half, the low half, and the top half, right? Now, if I, but in, at first we're just going to look at this on the on the plane, but actually you'll see later the better way to look at this is the way Riemann did, which is to think of this as a sphere. So really, what you have is a Riemann sphere, and you have a the uh, uh, not the equator, the uh, line of the, the the line of longitude one line circle of longitude, right, which divides it into two hemispheres, okay? So the south pole would be zero, and the north pole would be the infinite. So in this case, the north pole is off to this, this side and off to this side, and every single one of these lines goes to the north pole. You mean in terms of a stereographic projection? Yeah. The south pole would be zero, zero and the north pole would project the Right, here. right. I'll show you a picture of that. I mean, I have a picture of that if you can't imagine it, but I don't have, I didn't have time to load all the relevant slides. Okay. So these three dots are 0, 1, and minus 1. Okay. So this would be the south pole. Now, now if this were projected stereographically on the sphere, these two dots would be on the equator. There wouldn't the be some. Dots, the one the brown one and the purple one. Okay. They would be on the equator. Okay, so what you could. You have this theory of projection. Yeah. Wait, wait. No. <laughs> Wouldn't those two lines be on the prime meridian that divided your sphere in half? Yeah, and these would be these would be on the equator, in the intersection of the equator with the prime meridian. Oh. Um. Oh, because it's a sphere, right? Uh. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Wait a minute, how come we can't get it to do that? Uh, <laughs> This thing is misbehaving, Dan. Okay. There you go. So there's the stereographic projection. That's how it works, right? So, so this is this is um. Uh, here. Here's one in which you can see it. So this is your grid, right? So this is at one. This is at minus i. That would be minus one. So one. This is the uh, um, equator. So you see these lines all become circles, which go through the north pole. They go out to infinity, and they reach infinity up here, right? And it is um, the huh? It is the north pole. North well, pole doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's the point at infinity. Okay. Okay. And these lines here, you know, go go this way to the north pole, right? And you see that they're all perpendicular here and they're perpendicular there. Is this how this grid you showed in the beginning would map, map onto, onto a, a sphere. sphere? Exactly. Right. So so those three points, one, zero, and minus one. You can't see zero and minus one because they're obscured by the sphere. Would be here, and as you as you travel along here. 
you're traveling along there. Now this is this is the simple idea of a physical tensor, right? Because you have what you have is you, you have not it's not this surface or that surface, but it's the single quantity which expresses the dynamic relationship between the way these two things are related to each other. So in other words, as you move along these yellow lines, your image would be there's a principle of change, right? As you move along these lines, there's a, you're changing in a certain way here. As you move along the brown lines, it changes in a certain way there. Right? So there's a principle of change between two principles of change. And that's what gets you this stereographic projection. So Riemann says, think if you think about this stereographic projection, then you can start to think about things on the sphere. So the singularities, these, the blue and the red dots, have no. anything... They're not singularities yet. Okay, I'll show you when they become singularities. Here, we're about to do that. Okay. Okay. All right, so, so, whoops, go back, go back. All right, so we got a top half and a bottom half. And the one you, you could have, you could do uh, these complex functions are simply mappings. They take all these relationships and they establish a principle of change that relates this principle, the way the, the way things change here, with the way things change on another surface. So one example, which is comparable to the stereographic projection, is represented by this map here, which I'm not showing it together, but this is the map of the top half of the this, this plane, right? The blue and the red. So what, what this function does is it takes this line here that goes through 0, 1, and minus 1, and it bends it around into a circle, right? And it bends all the all these lines in here, it bends them around, it makes them change in such a way that they behave the boundary becoming a circle on a straight line. And the way that looks is would look like this. So this is now the infinite, right? So all these lines, this is the, the real line. Here would be 0. 1 would be somewhere here. Minus 1 would be there. And you go around, and this is the, this is the infinite. Why does it also have this similar hole as a sphere? Because it, that's right. This is, in a sense, a flat version of a stereographic projection. So everything in the top half would map inside this circle. And I didn't do it. I didn't have time to draw it. But the green and black part would map to the outside of the circle. Right? Why does it have a chunk bit out of it? <laughs> that's the issue. <laughs> You just have to get closer and closer and closer to the infinite, but you get exponentially. Why isn't the infinite a point? I thought it is a point. It's right here. <laughs> I just I just only extended this out a little ways. If I tried to extend it to the infinite, first of all, the computer would take forever. And <laughs> secondly, I, you, would just, you would just clo get closer. This 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 little I see. curly cube would get smaller and smaller and smaller, but it would converge on one point right there. And those, and those four corners are each the the, the corners of your. Right. Sure. These four. These are the four corners. This is my. Right. This is the four corners of the square. Right. Okay. So, so you see, it's it's it, what you have is a, is is a tensor. You have this 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 now this straight line curved around and transformed everything inside of it to behave what the conditions at the boundary. Were. What did you say the black and the green grid would do? That, that, that would map to the outside. Well, you can picture this. If you think of the stereographic projection, right, then everything in the southern hemisphere maps to a circle. And everything in the northern hemisphere maps inside that circle, right? And everything in the northern hemisphere will map outside that circle. So if you were to sort of unwrap the, the, the sphere onto a plane, you'd have a circle, and inside that circle would be everything in the southern hemisphere, and outside that circle would be everything in the northern hemisphere. So if you think of those two halves of the 
of the um, sphere, instead of being like this, you know, with the South Pole and the North Pole, thinking of them being like that, then how would that map look? So it's another way of doing that kind of map. So with the four corners of the green grid, the they would come here too. They they come to infinity. Yeah. Okay. Now, so now that's a boundary. This is the kind of a boundary that Riemann. Uh, that's all, no, I, all smooth. It has no singularities on it. But what if you take a function which has singularities in the rate of change? Okay, and you have that, for example, with the sine and the cosine function because at at four points on the circle, mm -hmm. right? Zero, which, zero actually, at, I'm sorry, at, at one and minus one, in the case of the sine function, the rate of the rate of change changes, it disappears. So when you look at that in the complex domain, you get this mapping. Okay. So now th in this case, you see these these uh, two points, which are one and minus one, become your sing become singularity, in which the function is not defined. But I'll show you. Here we have. What do you mean the function is not? Well, okay, I'll show you. There you have a closer view of it. Think about it this way. The characteristic of these red, the reason why why <coughs> often why Riemann focuses on these red and blue lines is that they're the lines that are perpendicular to each other. Okay? And if you remember the thing, the principle of Gauss from the curvature, right? That on any surface you can set up a system of curves which are geodesics. And then you can always set up a system of curves which are perpendicular to those geodesics. So that's the way physical processes work. So, so the red and the these are these are the these are the curves which are everywhere perpendicular to each other, right? So you see that they touch the boundary perpendicular. And same same with this in this one. All the blue cut touch the boundary perpendicularly. Okay, at ninety degrees. Huh? But at no point is there anywhere. In okay. Okay. Now, but if you look at, at here, these, oh, there's the, there's the information. Right. You look at the black line here, you can see the image of the black line moving here. So here's the point. If you look at the boundary here, let me actually go to the one before. <coughs> If you look at the boundary the, the, the here, the blue line, the blue lines touch the boundary perpendicularly, right? Except here, is that perpendicular? Think about it this way: if you're walking along this line here, you see these blue lines are always perpendicular to you, right? You know where infinity is. But when you get right here, which which is perpendicular? What's perpendicular to a corner? The other, the other side of the corner. Yeah, but how do you know where that is? You're right at the corner. Right? You're at a different type of infinitesimal. It's where the principle of change is not defined. There's a discontinuity there. Right? So Riemann's point is that the discontinuity you can, you can map these complex maps, the, the um, uh, singularities of a function. Actually, this is the wrong one. This is not the one I want. This is the one we're looking at. Okay. You can map the singularities of the function. Oh, I put that in the wrong place. That was my problem. Um, yeah. This is the wrong one. That had that. That's the elliptical function. Has four. How do you create the, the new map? How do you create the, the okay. function map? Okay. Well, this what this is this map 
is the map that transforms this into a um, this is a function which has two singularities and tra it basically turns t takes takes these two points and moves them to here then puts a corner there okay and um, and then, then it goes off to infinity and that's what the that's what the side function does but how do you know how to produce that map because if you know, you think about how the sine function works, right? The sine function has two singularities, at one and minus one. Mm -hmm. And the cosine, the cosine would have a similar thing, it would just have its two singularities at, at um, zero, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry. Yeah, the sine would be one and minus one. So here you, here's an animation of, of, of how it works, I think. So the thing you have to imagine is imagine that the transformation you're talking about is that you do this, you're moving on a straight line here, and its image is this black line there. So here it moves, continues on a straight line when it gets to the brown point, whereas its image is to make a left turn of 90 degrees. And then continue on to infinity. And you see how that then determines that all these other curves are going to have to be of this shape. Because they're, as geodetics, they're now being defined by the relationship of that. To the two singularities. Line to the two singularities. Mm -hmm. Which you would then call a boundary condition. Right. And the point that Riemann is says is it doesn't matter where the two where the singularities are or what they are or anything else. They're just it, 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 the point is is that they're two. Mm. Now, then you get the question of the elliptical function, in which you have two incommensurabilities. You have the arc with the angle, and you have the sine with the angle. So you have a double incommensurability. So instead of two singularities, you're going to have four. And so the the map of the um, elliptical <coughs> function is this one, where you now have four singularities. And here you have a still of it, but I was able to make a animation. There you go. <coughs> Well, that's that's what you have. That's just a sphere because this, you have the North Pole. Okay. Everything I approaches the sphere. North Pole. I could make it so that I had two singularities in that sphere. How? If I did a Mercator projection, then both the North and the South Pole would explode. Yeah, but there, but it's just one because then then your then zero is in the middle. And the north and the south pole are both infinity. So that how is <laughs> no, how those is that are still just one singularity? Because they're because they're on a sphere. You know, if you have a Mercator projection, what you have to think of is you've got your north and your south, and then you just curve them around. It's like it's like the circle, right? Yeah. One is going this way and one is going that way, but they're both headed towards infinity. <coughs> it's like in this plane. This is infinite. This is infinite, right. two different directions, but they're really headed for the same place, right here. Okay. So you see the way this works right here? You've got four singularities. This thing starts when it hits the dots here, in the image, it makes a right turn, or it makes a 90 degree angle. Right. And at that point, the direction it's going is, is, is ill-defined, but it's defined from the standpoint of the characteristic of the function as a whole. Yeah, it talks about that in the surface. Yeah. Per surface paper. You can't determine the rate of change at a vertex 
Right. Okay, now, Riemann said, well, okay, what about functions that have n singularities in them? Well, he says that's really simple. <laughs> because what you can do is you can take the, the, of the, you can take the n singularities and you can group them into groups of triangles where the vertex of the tri the three vertices of the triangles are the things and you could pick the three vertices arbitrarily but he he picks them as 0 1 and the infinite okay now then the only the only variation is the angle between the sides and if the uh, so here's an example all right here i have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine singularities. Or eight, yeah, eight. Well, actually, this is four right here all together. So I've got, this is, this is 60. So you see, these are all 90 degree, this is a triangle with four 90, three 90 degree angles. So at this corner is zero, at this corner is one, at this corner is the infinite. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going. Away. I see. <laughs> okay, but huh? I think there's a yeah. spider on drugs. You just wait. You meant three ninety degree angles. Three? Did I say? You said four. Okay. <laughs> wait, where are the three? Right? We're, we're trying to keep oh, up with you. One, two, and then this one here. There's nothing there. Well, if this were to go to infinity, it would intersect the ninety it's degrees. Like what you said. So each one of these represents a complete half a sphere. So there's this, this is half a sphere, this is half a sphere, this is half a sphere, this is half a sphere. And it's as if we had each, in each quadrant, we had that plane that we started off with right. in the beginning projected. Right. That's right. Okay. And so what this, but, because of the characteristic of this being three 90 degree angles, there's not an unlimited number of singularities you can have with this. In fact, there's a determined number of singularities. Can you say that again? And that's it. You recognize that? Sure. <laughs> you don't recognize that, Rihanna? <laughs> well, but you've seen this a million times in the basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's what Vinny's brought in. Oh. 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 You got four quadrants here and the four quadrants there. So the octahedron, this is just the, the simple case of the octahedron. But the octahedron is a special case of the hypergeometric function. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Email in this picture. So you see this is a normal map. You'll understand it right away. <laughs> So this is this is the, this is the this is the upper half plane and this is the lower half plane. Or this is one hemisphere. This is the other hemisphere. Yeah. Can you go back to the picture? This one I did. I, I didn't have time to make all these to do all to do these all right. Now the other way you can do them, which so is actually the way Riemann. Uh, well, this is one way you might talk. The other way you can do them is you can divide this. You can divide each one of these up into two. Uh, squares, two triangles. Anyway, you, there are different combinations you can get. In other words, you could take the octahedral face and you could divide each face into six triangles. And the angles of those six triangles would be pi over three, pi over two, and pi over four, etc. So okay. that all four of those circles would be half the sphere? Right.
Where is infinity on this? The North Pole, right here. <laughs> so you see the projections here, these things go out like that. Right? But on the sphere, you see how they... Does mathematic understand this? Is this if you beat it up, yeah. if you beat it up and smash it and <laughs> spit at it and do all these nasty things, curse at it a lot. Basically, it's language. It's language is very dumb. Okay, so here you have another one, right, which is the other direction, right? Instead of, in other words, if the angles, <coughs> if the angles of the triangle are, um, if the sides of the triangle, <coughs> I'm sorry, if the angles of the triangle are a certain, the sum of the angles of the triangles is 180 degrees then you're going to make plane figures. And there's a limited number of ones you can make. If the sum of the angles of the triangles is greater than 180 degrees, then there are only five cases for that. For the regular solids, but you could actually, the Archimedean solids can be also made, this are also special cases of the hypergeometric function. And the Kepler-Poinceau solids are special cases of the arc of the hypergeometric function in which the you have two spheres. What if you were going to try to do pupil divisions of an ellipsoid? <laughs> well you would still I don't know, you still have the same the ellipsoid topologically is the same as the sphere. So you probably you probably you can only get you think so? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. What are the Kepler-Poinceau solids? Poinceau solids? Uh -huh. Pointy ones. Huh? Pointy ones. The stellated ones that he oh, has. Okay. okay, so here you have the, uh, but now if the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees, then you can have an increase in the number of singularities. So here's a picture of what that would look like. And in this case, I, I, I did this earlier. I had different colors for this. So this is <laughs> pink and black instead of green and black, right? And so this is the lower half. This is one hemisphere, and this is this is the other hemisphere. So each one of these sections is a whole sphere. It's right? a whole sphere. Yeah. Yeah. This is this would be like the green black, the bottom half. This would be the top half. Okay. And the angles here are uh, this angle, the angle that this would make, and this and this are all equal. This is the Gauss. This is the one Gauss drew a picture of. So it's all 45 degrees. So this is zero, this is one, this is the infinite. Is this a negatively curved triangle? Yes. So this goes to the infinite, this goes to the infinite, there's one, there's the infinite, which is the, you have to imagine the continuation of these things like that. Okay. It would continue like this. And this one would continue like this. So you have eight. And <coughs> you have to imagine, as Gauss did, a whole circle around it. And then this can, can continue. This one can be projected that way and so on and so on. I don't have that I didn't have time to make that picture. So that's the that's Riemann's representation, geometrical representation of this idea of the physical hypergeometries. You had said that if the triangles are over 180, there's five platonic, that there's five. There, yeah, if it, then, then if they're over 180 degrees, if the sum of the angles is over 180 degrees, mm -hmm. then there are only um, five cases or variations of those five that that you can that will fit together. There are five platonic solids. I don't know that we're trying. I thought we were oh, well, trying. But you can you can make a, a, a pentagon by making uh, putting triangles together. Right? You can put five triangles together. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. It. And the icosahedron. Well, that, that's where the, you get the duals. It, it turns out that the 
octahedron and the cube and the icosahedron and the dodecahedron actually are just variations of the same mapping. It just depends on the combination of these angles. But that's pretty interesting to think of the five regular solid. And Riemann did this. And it wasn't until much later that Felix Klein screwed the whole thing up. But Riemann's whole idea is that this, you know, this is the, that when you're looking at this question of the five regular solids or the, um, uh, you're, when you're looking at this question of physical hypergeometries, the, what, it, what it fundamentally boils down to is the question of the relationship between the number of singularities and the, uh, the, and the physical characteristics that must occur with, the, with the, 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 the change in the geometry with those density of singularities. That's why, if you look at this question of the mass effect, how you introduce a singularity into it, and then that changes the whole direction of everything, and people go out and vote their conscience. <laughs> Because <laughs> you've changed the whole shape, the whole way everything is interacting. Right? Everything is interacting in a completely different way because you've introduced a new singularity at the boundary which reorders the curvature of everything inside that geometry. So the only real representation, appropriate concept for the uh, idea of an anti-entropic physical universe is Riemann's idea of a succession of physical hypergeometries which are characterized by an increasing density of singularities. And singularities are defined as those uh, physical uh, uh, the 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 um, the singularities are defined as the the the, the <coughs> infinitesimal expression of the principle of change. I go back to the idea of the Keplerian orbit, right? It's the, it's actually the minimum and maximum speed which express the relationship of the whole solar system within the, each individual planetary orbit, right? You have the, 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 plant, the whole orbit and you have the individual, the, the minimum and maximum speed is the, um, is the thing that sort of <coughs> is the are the hanging points on which the orbit hangs with respect to the rest of the solar system, and that's that's really where the whole orbit, the whole solar system, the the relationship of everything within that orbit to the solar system as a, as a whole is represented in that in that little uh, in that <coughs> singularity. is that he's using the word, don't get confused by his use of the word equant there. What he means by equant there is something different than what Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe uses. What he means by equant there is that the Earth has a place 
which is, if you, in other words, if you think of the equant as being the center of motion, as opposed to the center of equal motion. So, it's, so when he says that the Earth has an equant, he's saying the Earth has a center of motion, but it's not the center of the orbit. But he also doesn't say it's the place of equal motion. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the difference. Whereas for uh, Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe, the equant is the place at which were you at that were the observer at that place, the observer would see the planet moving equally. And he disproves in the vicarious hypothesis that there's no such place. That's the thing that the that the planet's motion is is everywhere non-uniform. It's very similar to the... Cusa lays it out in a very meta, beautiful metaphor in the second book of Learned Ignorance. He says, there is no center to the center... And Kepler quotes this, right? The center is everywhere and nowhere. He says, you're standing on the Earth and it appears that you're at the center and that the pole of the universe is above you. Is, you know, where the North Pole is. But... The North Celestial Earth. But... If you were there, that would appear to be the center. And where you're standing would appear to be the pole. So there is no pole or center of the physical, of the universe. Kuzma keeps hammering on this point, right? This is the point that he's making. Well, you can think about this concept if you think about an infinite circle, an infinite line, and an infinite triangle. He doesn't say that there is an infinite circle, there is an infinite line. He says, if there were an infinite circle, if there were an infinite line, if there were an infinite triangle, they would all be the same. So there's no... So the universe is that which produces all these things. And so what, what uh, Kepler does is demonstrate that the physical universe conforms to Kuz's idea that it's everywhere non-uniform, not... Uh, the Aristotelian idea that even though it may appear to be non-uniform, there has to be some place in the universe. Whether there's anything there or not doesn't matter, but there has to be some place that, that, would, that would equalize this non-uniformity. The pendulum has to swing left and right and left and right. It has to be an equilibrium. There has to be some equilibrium state. And Kepler says, no, there is no equilibrium state. So when he says in the third book that the Earth has an equant, what he means by equant there is different. Than, he's not saying it has a point of equal motion. He's saying it has a center of motion. In other words, it's not moving around an epicycle. It's not moving on an arc without reference to something. right? In other words, its motion is not guided by the arc. It's guided by its relationship to this point. Now, of course, he already knows when he introduces this that at this point is the sun. So what he's sort of being a little bit coy there, right? He's saying, okay, the Earth has an equant, i.e. It, it does have a center of motion. <coughs> but that center of motion is, is not, the cent not the point of equal motion. But it's the, it's the source, it's the physical source of the motion. Yeah. Before he gets to that, though, he tries to introduce an equant. Yeah, he calls it an equant. No, he doesn't say, okay, it's the sun. He no, I know. He introduces a place that's above, he'd have to say the center of the sun, and a place that would be above that. Mm -hmm. Which he says, uh, up until he gets to the question of the physical causes of the sun, he says it's the equant. Right, but what I'm saying is that I, what he's, when he talks about that as the equant, when he's talking about the sun there, he, he's, he's being a little coy in the way he sets that up. Because he's trying to get you to say, okay, well, there is no place of uniform motion, but there's some center of motion that's actually moving. Then he gets to the point, well, well what has to be at that place is the sun. No, I don't think he yeah. talks, he doesn't bring up sun. He brings up three points, the center of the eccentric, the center of the world, and then the equant. He doesn't actually deem anything as sun in that section, 32. Not 33. Well, no, he talks about section 33, 34, the immaterial species, the sun is the mover. Right. He does get to that. Yeah. Before that, in the beginning of part three, right. he 
says that because Copernicus thought that the center, that the, that the place of uniform motion, that the Earth moves in the constant rate of speed, was the center of the orbit. And Kepler says that for the Earth, right. it's not the center of the right. orbit. It's not the center of the orbit. Right, it's an eccentric point. It's someplace off center. That the center of motion, yeah, but 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 what he means by equal motion there is not equal arcs. That's the difference. What he means that the the set the equality of motion is not the point at which there's equal arcs and equal times, because the equal motion in as he later shows is the equal areas. I don't agree. You don't agree. I don't agree either. <laughs> no. I don't I'm agree sorry. Either. Uh -oh. I think he has. I think he's forced to have recourse to the E one. Why? Because of the Kepler problem. Because if you're going to try to measure equal time, and you're going to look at distances in terms of equal time, and you're going backwards, and you're saying I need to divide my orbit in equal time segments, and compare distances from those equal time segments. There's no possible way for me to do it in, 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 in terms of what Kepler has. So he's forced to use an equant so that he can have some way of having some sort of equal time division to be able to do any kinds of comparisons. No, he uses the equal time. He, he measures the equal times as the areas. I know, but he does that. He, he, has he does that at the end, though. He does that later. I know. Yeah. But he, but but to be able to to do some of these preliminary investigations, right. he has to use the because but he doesn't have anything else. That's right. But which what is I, why he brings back the, no, the vicarious hypothesis. He says I have to use it. It works for longitudes, so I'm going to return to it now. Right. But he's but you see. But that's what I'm saying. You you've got to look at the irony that he's bringing out there. The point is he's already shown that the that the um, that the that the uh, solar system is everywhere non-uniform. So that's where he's headed, and so his introduction of the equant there is not that the equant is not the Earth's equant is the same as the Ptolemy Copernicus or Bryant equant. He's he's sort of boxing. He's in a sense he's doing again what he did with the vicarious hypothesis. He's forcing you to the point. Where he's he's showing you how he, you're you're forced to recognize that you cannot find there is no point of equal motion in the in this in the planetary orbit. There's no place where if you were standing if you were standing at the sun, you wouldn't see equal arcs and equal times. No. Okay. But that's but he's not talking about the sun. He's talking about He's talking about the point which is equally distant from the center as the sun is on one side as... No, but that's not what the equant is. That's a different point. The equant is the place where if you were standing, you would see equal motions. I, yeah. Okay. What he talks about with a bisected equant is... What he's talking about, a bisected... That's, that's just because you can't get with the... You can't get with the earth at the center and the equant... You, can't, you need three points. You need the center, you need the Earth on the other side of the center to get enough eccentricity to f make the observations fit the equation. Right. That's what Ptolemy introduced. He does bisect the equation. Of course. He, he does that in chapter what, 30, 28, I think. Yeah. 31. I well, I don't know the chapter numbers. You know them better than me. Before he gets into the, the, the question of speed being caused by its distance. But he bisects, so he's saying that there's the distance between the center of the equant and the center of the sun are the same, but then he makes his physical breakthrough in 32. That's right. So well, it's what, all but driving towards a physical breakthrough. Right. But he says, first, I have to introduce, prove that there's a equant in the theory of the Earth, because they didn't have that before. It didn't exist for the Right, times. but what he's, what he's doing there is not proving that the Earth has a point of equal motion. What he's doing is he's saying that the Earth, it also, is in an eccentric orbit in, yeah. which, the, in yeah. which the center of motion is not the center of the orbit. That's what he's doing there. He has the physical, he, he, you see, don't, 
remember, he, he's not he's writing, he's not making this up as he goes along. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I think what, one thing he does is that he says that I, I approach this in a certain way, and I want to know what it is. So, can my critics of course. not just say, you know, he doesn't sit, because he could just say, well, here's my discovery. Yeah, he right. Shows, he tries to say, I've gone through the whole process, He's so doing my critics can't attack me. Worse than that. So I, yeah. I the, not I only, only that. He's going to, so not so that his critic, not just that his critic. Yeah, that's why we one way he puts it. But what he's doing is he's skewering his critics because he's he's by going through it in that way. He's it is it's a, it's a very ironic way that he does it, right? Because by going through it that way, he's once again forcing you to realize that the place around the center of motion, the pivot, he sometimes calls it, right? around which the planets revolve is not the place of equal times and equal arcs. And he, that, 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 that no such place exists. He already did that in the, he already proved that in a sense in the vicarious hypothesis. He returns to it in chapter 3, not for the same reason that he, that Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe did it in, in, the, in part 2 of what he just disputed it. He returns to it Simply for the to to drive home the point again mm -hmm. that when you look at the actual physical when you get to my physical hypothesis, this point there's only one center of motion. There's the center of the orbit is nothing. Okay, the 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 uh, the what 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 it what exists is the physical place of motion, and that place is not equal is not the point of equal motion. So he's doing, in a sense, this by, by introducing what appears to be introducing the equine in the, in the, um, in part three, is not reintroducing the equine yeah. of Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe. It's a more, it's a much more ironical thing there. He's not introducing it in order to disprove it. He's, in a sense, boxing you in to say, okay, well, there's a point, uh, there's a center of motion of Earth. It's not at the center as everybody, as Copernicus said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And what is that point? Well, we'll start start by calling it an equant. And okay, what what would what would what would around how would this thing work with this equant? But if you were to try and look for equal arcs and equal times at this equant, it doesn't work. So you have this physical hypothesis. Now he comes back and says, oh, what was this thing I called an equant? Oh, well, it's not the point of equal times, equal arcs in equal times. It's actually the center of motion, and there's something physically there. It's called the sun. <laughs> so in other words, it's again... Think about it from the standpoint of this question of a differential function. The position of the sun <coughs> is determined by the principle of change, which he's measuring with respect to the planets. He doesn't start by saying, where's the sun? He starts by saying, what's the principle of change? That principle of change has a leads to a singularity. What's that singularity? That's the sun. That's what the sun is. It's not just an object in the sky. It's the point around which, it's the singular place around which both Mars and Earth are pivoting. Right? So it's a it's a it's an ironical thing that he's doing there. In other words, he says, okay, the Earth, the center of the Earth's orbit is not the center as Copernicus had. There's something, it's, it's not on the center. Let's call it an equant. All right? Let's try and see what happens if you look at, try and understand the Earth's motion from the standpoint of that point. What is that point? Now look at the principle of change. What does that tell you about that point? Well, what it tells you about that point is that that point is not an equant. That point is a physical singularity, which is not the point of equal motion. It's the center of physical movement. And the principle of, of, of equal movement there is not the 
uh, is not the arc, but it's in the reciprocating motion of the changing distance of the planet to the sun. And then the, the equality is measured by the sum, equal sums of those radii, right? And he says, since they're infinite, you add them up according to area. You see what I'm saying? You get the, I think, yeah. I think you could get misled if you think about it, if you try and define it, if you look, if you don't understand that, right? Because he's not making it up as he goes along. Yeah. Well, what I was had in thinking, it's kind of in the direction of what you said, is that he, he proves that there's, as he says at the end of part two, that there's no place where you can stand where everything's going to move perfectly uniform. Right. And then, because Copernicus and everyone had almost like a separate set of laws for the Earth's orbit compared to what they were saying for the rest, that he then applies that same thing to the Earth's orbit and shows that it's the same for that. It's like he, had, he proves it for Mars, proving it for the other planets, but then he says, I'm going to, and then he turns his attention to Earth. And so for the second inequality of Earth's motion, I'm going to investigate the physical causes, and he shows that the Earth's motion is bounded by the same <coughs> the same laws right. that the rest of the planets are. Right. And he starts off by, I think, showing how the Earth's orbit has some of the same characteristics as the other ones, and then he gets into the question of the physical Right. Yeah. Right. So, so the first thing he has to do is show that the center of the Earth's orbit is nothing is no big deal. It's, there's yeah. nothing happening there. So he says the, se the the pivot, the center of motion, is not the center of the Earth's orbit. The action is somewhere else. You don't know that by seeing what's there, right? You know it because if you look at the principle by which the Earth's motion is changing, uh, or inversely, the Sun's motion. Because the sun is mo the sun is non-uniform. That's observable, right? Mm -hmm. So if you say that the sun's non-uniform motion is the is the actual observation of the Earth's non-uniform motion, which is what he's saying, mm -hmm. then the center of the Earth's orbit. What the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> the center of the Earth's orbit is not. Don't worry, we're in the green zone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of tourists come to Washington during Christmas. Right. The center, you know, it's not the center of the orbit. There's some place it's not in the orbit. Let's call it an equator. Mm -hmm. So it's like he's beginning to rock the boat in terms of. He's once again saying, okay, even the place you're standing on is not moving uniformly. Mm -hmm. He starts chipping away. Yeah. He's saying, even the place you're standing on is not moving uniformly. Everything is geared towards that. Everything is geared towards demonstrating conclusively that the Earth, the universe is everywhere non-uniform. That that's not a problem. That's good. <laughs> that's why he worked so hard on the new astronomy. It took him ten years to put it together, right? He didn't... He didn't... Uh, he wasn't able to... He didn't have an apple drop on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I get the idea. Right, but that's what he's doing. So that, and that you can't lose sight of that. That's what, that's what, um, and that's what Gauss and that's what Riemann is really picking up on on this question of the the, the hypergeometric function, the idea of hypergeometries, is that, that that it's not, there is no one function or set of functions which express physical principles. Because if you look at all these different physical principles, you get these different differential functions. And you can solve these differential functions in various complicated ways. And what Riemann says, well, wait a minute, but when you look at all these differential equations which come up in physics that we've discovered, 
So they're all special cases. This is what Gauss already showed. They're all special cases of a, of a single function. So what's the solution to this function? Well, it has a whole bunch of different solutions depending on the special cases, right? But he says, well, what's the general principle? And what he's really showing in all this complicated stuff here is that what it really boils down to, that's why he, invent, he, he actually replaces the idea of the hyper, he shows the hypergeometric function is a special case of something that he called the p-function. That's all he called it. It's called, it's called Riemann's p-function. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and Riemann's p-function, I'll write it down for you. <laughs> I, take it, I take it p in German doesn't mean the same thing. I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it, he, this is the way he writes his p-function. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't be any easier to read if I wrote it right. <laughs> <laughs> it all means the same answer. That's all it is. So there's no pluses or minuses or multiplication or anything like that. And the hypergeometric function is the special case when A is equal to 0, B is equal to 1, and C is equal to infinity. That's the special case. And these right here determine the angles at the vertices of the triangle. These are the vertices and these are the angles of the vertices. That's, that's the most explicit he is with writing out the function. He said you don't have to write out these functions. You can, you can take, he actually says somewhere there's like 250 special functions that are all special cases of this. But what he's interested in is not particular numerical solutions for them, those you can figure out. What he's saying, what is the general characteristic hypergeometry of the physical universe? And he shows what his basic point is, is that that hypergeometry depends really on a couple of simple characteristics. And that is the number of singularities and the relationship of those singularities to the Basically, the number of singularities. That's really what it boils down to. So, who is this part three? It proves that there's no area where there's equal motion. The equal, the little e equal, equal circle. arcs with equal motion. Yeah. Yeah, the, the little equal circle. Jason right. made this big right. thing. And the equal circle is the little thing. That Which w out. right? That there's only a place because that would always have to change, right? If there's a little equal there, right. then everything would always have to change, right? right? That there is a, a point in which you can produce equal arc or equal, or that the, the distance is always inversely proportional to the, the time travel or the, the arc. The speed is always inversely proportional to the, to, the distance. to the distance, and therefore the the equal the, the yeah yeah the portion of equal the the, the equal. Time periods are equal, are those are measured by equal areas, not equal arcs. Yeah. And so th he proves that there's a point that can do that, but there's no point that can produce. The well, no, he proves that there's a physical point mm -hmm. at which the planet is, around which the planet is moving non uniformly, and the speed of the planet is inversely proportional to its distance to that point, which is the sun. Okay? So then he asked the question, well, okay, what is, since that would mean that all the arcs are unequal, there will be equal arcs and unequal, unequal times and unequal arcs, mm -hmm. the question he, he puts to them is, well, okay, how do I measure equal time? What is equal? How do I take this orbit? I know it has one period, is the way, right, that it has one interval from the beginning to the end, which is the the only interval which is where the planet's doing the same thing at the beginning as the end. So that's my whole. Mm -hmm. How do I divide that up into equal parts? It's not equal arcs. The equal arcs are not equal parts. 
But we know that the equal that the the arc traveled is inversely. No, not the arc traveled. The speed is inversely proportional. The rate at which it's traveling the arc is inversely proportional to the distance. But since the distance is changing at every moment, the rate is changing at every moment. Can you also say the time traveled? So that you're dealing with a differential equation. You're dealing with the you principle of change. time traveled instead of speed? Is that, is that also the same? No. Don't, don't think about time. Think about time. You see, here's the problem. You're thinking about time as if it were an independent variable, an independent quantity. It's not. It's dependent quantity. It's determined by the motion of the planet itself. What you mean by time is the motion of the planet. What do you mean by an hour? You mean when the hour hand, when the minute hand rotates around one, one full rotation on your watch, right? So it's one complete rotation is your unit of measure of time, right? So, the, so time for Earth or for Mars is one complete rotation. How does he measure that the equal arcs are, or that the, the speed is inverse to the, the distance? That he doesn't measure that. He, sa he looks at that and he sa that's empirically determined. Oh, is it? That's hypothesis. Right. And then he shows that that's what the, that's what the uh, is actually going on. In other words, he has, Dan, he has the <coughs> changing speeds. And he has this place inside the orbit, which he uh, hypothesizes is the place, the center of motion. And he says, okay, then if, if, if you, have, he says, I'm going to start with a physical hypothesis. Forget what's causing the planet to move. What's causing the planet to move is a species. And the effect of the species diminishes with distance. Yeah. So that the speed of the planet is pro inversely proportional to the distance. Mm -hmm. And then he says, okay, what would that orbit look like? And then he gets the circular orbit with the planet not at the, with the sun not at the center, and that doesn't work. And then he has to make the sun, then he has to go to the elliptical orbit. So you've got your... Rihanna's, Rihanna's <laughs> going to defeat me with text. <laughs> oh! 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 Yeah, well, if yeah. we all agreed, we'd be one homogenous That's mass. Right. <laughs> weenus. Weenus. <laughs> what the weenus is. No, I think he only introduces the equant there. It, it's, he's not what he's... I know. I know. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll have to duke it out afterward. <laughs> when I'm done with the harmony. All right. <laughs> No, I know. Take it up to the take it up to Lynn. We'll see. <laughs> so, does the comma appear only in certain? points in the motet? <laughs> no, I think it's everywhere. Because it seems like that what, what you're looking at with the comma, you're looking at, because when Lynn's comparing it to an infinitesimal, but I mean, my narrow understanding of the infinitesimal is that it's a moment of, of ambiguous, not ambiguous, but it's a moment of change that you can't, it's not uh, mathematically describable. In some way. I, I, I mean, I could be completely off. And no, you're off right. Again. You're not but, off. You're, but you're it, it seems, though, that if you're going to take that, that there would be specific points in, a, in an entire... Because if, if, if a moment of infinitesimal reflects the whole, there has to be certain parts in, say, for instance, the motet, where 
when you get that tuning, that tuning that you want, that, that somehow reflects the whole the whole uh, part of the motet you're working on. Mm -hmm. Like in the Unterdein and Schirm, you right. know? Um, I'm just not quite sure. Because um, it seems like whenever you have multiple voices together, you're, you can, you, the issue of tuning is always there. But it seems like perhaps at more instances than not, some, there's particular instances in the motet where it's more apparent. Well, it's sure. It, it, there's certain incidents where where you've got more dissonance and so forth, where it becomes more apparent. But it's always there. Mm -hmm. It's always there because the actual pitches that the that the uh, singers have to sing is determined. It is not cannot be cannot be determined by some uh, simple fixed relationship. It's not the same every time the singers are singing that interval. Because it all depends on where they're coming from and where they're going to. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, yes, the Pythagorean comma is very much like this question of the equon. Where the planet is every the, the planet the the, the 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 relationship among the pitches is always changing. And that change is expressed by the Pythagorean comma. The comma in the sense is the difference. It's the it's the it's the it's the principle by which you have to change. And that is not determined by the individual. It's not predetermined. It has to be determined by the context of the piece as a whole. And you say, well, how does the conductor and the singers figure that out? Well, the conductor and singers figure that out by as that, by that which it takes to communicate the idea. And that's also changing. That also changes as people's skills develop and as their concept of the piece develops. You know, you can listen. There's a few. I mean, the Amadeus Quartet talks about this. They talk about how you know their their concept of the quartets changed as they played together. And there are these new recordings out, or a re-release of these recordings of the um, of the. Uh, uh, Mozart, some of the Mozart quartets that they did early on in the 1950s, and then there's a release of them in the late 1960s. So you can actually compare. Do they the sound si very different? I mean, you know, they, they they sound yeah, they sound noticeably different. Yeah, sure. Uh,